Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Stroke Empowerment Sessions. My name is Letitia Living, and I am joined today by Jamie Stevens, who's coming in from Florida in the US. Hi, Jamie. Hello. I would say good morning, but it's good evening for you. <laughs> yes. Good morning to you. Good evening to me. Okay. Yeah. So tell us, Jamie, um, you're a hemorrhagic stroke survivor, but before we go into post-stroke life, let's hear a bit about you before your stroke. Who were you? How old were you? What did every day look like for you before you had a stroke? Um, well, I was 44 years old and I worked um, as a director for a property management company. And I'd been doing that for about 20 years. Um, single, no kids, just me and my dog, you know, very active friends going out, doing things, going to the beach, the pool. Um, I do improv comedy. So I was performing a lot, you know, just very active and mobile and on the go. <laughs> So quite a full, happy life. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And then, well, something happened. You had a stroke. Tell us about the lead up to that. Where were you? What were you doing at the time of your stroke? Well, it was actually a one week after my 44th birthday. And I was, I had flown home to Kansas for my grandmother's funeral. And I was with my mom and my sister at my niece's soccer game. And my sister's a nurse and she saw the signs that I was having a stroke. I started getting really bad headache. I started getting nauseous and throwing up. Um, so she called 911. Um, the ambulance came and they were taking their time. My sister actually lifted me and put me on the gurney because they were going so slow. She, they, were, they didn't believe that I was having a stroke. My sister kept saying she's having a stroke. Her blood pressure is extremely elevated. This isn't normal. And they were like, no, she's just having a panic attack. And, and that was one thing my sister said. She was like, I realized then that it's just the go-to for medical personnel to see a woman, you know, and, and having those kind of, kind of symptoms. And they think, oh, they're just, it's anxiety driven. It's a panic attack. Well, they didn't even put the sirens on. They called it in as a code yellow and said it wasn't that serious. Um, my sister actually drove behind the ambulance to the hospital. She used to work at the hospital with the doctor that was on call and the doctor, she told him, she was like, she's having a stroke. And, and also another reason they didn't think that I was having a stroke was because you know how they have you grab like the two fingers, like they would have, and they, and I could grab both of them. And I didn't have my left side, even though I couldn't, like I'd slid off my sister's couch. I was still able to grab, so they didn't think I was having a stroke, but my sister, you know, convinced the doctor, and the doctor took me in for a CT stick scan, and that's when he saw the brain bleed, and they life lighted me to the city, to the neurologist, but yeah, well, it's very scary. That, that is scary, and that, that's quite a lot, because at the time, were you wondering or thinking to yourself, I know something's not right here, mm -hmm. and they're not taking me seriously? Yeah. And I mean, I never thought that I was at risk for a stroke. I think maybe a couple of times I had high blood pressure, but I would just have a headache and take something. And, and now I'm like, you've got to listen to your body. If you've got a headache, that's not normal. You should find out why you're having a headache. So it's just, you know, like now I look back and I'm like, Oh, I've been, I was taking headache medicine for probably six months leading up to my stroke and didn't even consider that I should look into why I'm having all these headaches. Mm, that's interesting that you say that. Um, and it just, I mean, as a young person, you, you just don't expect that stroke is something that's going right. to be in your foreseeable future. No, not at all. And I mean, I, I was in the hospital for two months, but I couldn't even sit up on my own. I couldn't, I had to learn to walk again. The doctor was like, you'll likely be in a wheelchair for two years. And I was honestly, I was actually three months post stroke back working, driving, walking with a cane. Um, you know, I just, I think I was very hard to get around in a wheelchair. I have a whole new respect for the disabled. And I was like, as hard as it is to get around in this wheelchair, I've got to get back walking again. Like all these assisted devices, I can't 
use these for the rest of my life. So I just worked really hard at PT and OT. And were you having the the PT and OT um, like rehab in hospital or were you um, discharged? Both. Mm-hmm. Both? Yep. Yeah, I did rehab in the hospital. Um, I was at, I was in ICU for about five days or so. And then I was in the hospital and then I went to rehab for like a month. And then I stayed in like an assisted living facility um, in the town where my family lived. And I stayed there for a few weeks and I stayed with my mom for a couple of weeks and then they, they flew me back to Florida. But that's, that's why I got stronger is because when I came back to Florida, I lived by myself and I had to like be able to do things myself. And I started doing outpatient therapy when I got back here. Um, yeah, that's incredible. So two months in rehab. Um, I just want to go back a bit. So you've got to hospital, you're in hospital. Um, do things deteriorate quickly for you once you've got into hospital? Um, because prior to earlier in that day, you were walking, you could squeeze. Mm-hmm. Um, and then did things just start deteriorating quickly? Yeah. When I was, when I was at my sister's house, I was sitting on her couch and I remember saying, I can't get myself up. And I looks, I like slid off the couch and she was like, she thought I was joking because I'm a, you know, I'm a comical comedian, improv actress. So she thought she was like, don't joke about that. You know? And then she realized I wasn't joking, but I mean, I couldn't even sit up on my own after the stroke. I couldn't, I mean, I was, I'm a very independent woman and I was now having to have someone else like take me to the bathroom, bathe me, you know, like wipe me, all that stuff. And I was like, just, I couldn't believe I was in the position that I was in, but everybody kept saying, you're a miracle. You're lucky to be alive because my sister was like, we saw you, we were saying our goodbyes, you know, like they didn't think I was going to make it. That's um, yeah, that's a lot for the family, isn't it? To, to see that. And especially having it happen so quickly, and um, and so you, yeah that that independence how did you feel like mentally and emotionally at that time um because you were fiercely independent was it hard to accept help at first I was like kind of angry and I was like why'd I live like why did I live to not be able to do things and then some I don't even remember who it was someone said to me one day this will all be a memory And I, it just like that, like clicked. And I was like, I want to look back on this time that I did the best that I could do in a crappy situation. And so I just started changing my outlook. And I was like, I would joke that I was at a spa vacation. I would like, my friends would come visit me and they would start. And like my, one of my friends sent me a massage gun and they were massaging me because all I wanted was stretch and massage because my body was in pain. And I was like, I'm just going to make the most out of this. And I had so many friends and family that I was able to spend time with because I was back in Kansas for two months. So I had visitors coming, people sending me things, showing up. So I was just, I mean, as hard as it was, I just kept saying, one day, this is going to be a memory. Let's just, you know, do the best I can to get through this and make the most out of it. So I just changed my perspective. Yeah, I love that. And I think that that's some really valuable um, advice to anybody that's listening is that your mindset really can make or break your experience while oh, yes. you know, you've been, your life has been suddenly impacted and now you're needing help. Um, how you view that and how you perceive that, you can still find, you know, purpose and meaningful um, experiences through that journey. And do you think, having that shift is where you really accepted it. And that's where your healing and recovery sped up. Oh yeah. Well, I was actually at my mom's house and I was like, this is when I first got out of the hospital. I said, mom, I just wish there was other, another young stroke survivor that I could talk to that has been through this and is better now. And she said, well, I think that's because that's going to be you for someone else. And so like, it was like, okay. And I was at that moment, I was like, it's like, I was frustrated, but I was like, and then I found your book and I started reading all the chapters and I was like, oh my gosh, there's other people like me. And that I think really helps to know that there's other people that have went through it. And when I get upset, like I, you can hear me cracking in my voice now, I'm like, I just let myself cry. 
And guess what? Afterwards, I'll be laughing. But you have to go through and feel all the emotions. Yeah. To, you just don't stay there, right? You just like, you feel it and you let it come out and then and you keep moving. You don't stay in that down position. And I just tried to do all the healthy things I can mentally and physically. Like I started talking to a therapist when I got back home. You know, I was, I was trying to do everything I could to heal and like even talking to you, I'm like, this is part of my healing, telling my story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sharing our stories. I mean, like you said, when it happened to you, I was I was the same when it happened to me. I thought I was the only person that was a young person that had, had a stroke. I didn't know anybody else that was young that had, had a stroke. I had no one to, you know, I don't want to say the word compare, but really compare my experience with or to relate to or who would understand um and that's I find that it's so important that we do share our stories so that people don't feel alone or isolated on the right yeah absolutely yeah your book real I actually read it twice <laughs> thank <laughs> you just like, well my memory I always had a great memory and I I did I've done well since the stroke but it's still not as well like I'm trying to do memory games and stuff but it's like the benefit is I can read books again and enjoy them again because I can't remember everything so and I've and improvs helped me a lot too with mem- like I realized when I was in the hospital and talking to the speech therapist like a lot of those memory games is improv and improv is like mm-hmm. being quick on your feet and so I think that that's helped me I was back performing three months post-stroke so, I mean, I was, you know, just do, I did a little bit at a time, but it was like another motivation for me to get back out there. And was it hard for you the first time to get back and do it again? It was, especially coming out in like a wheelchair, I kind of felt embarrassed, mm-hmm. you know, but I was like, listen, this isn't my forever. You know, this is just a part of my story. So, you know, just, and I felt like I had to do it. From, and I did it and I was you know and I felt better and it it's like the more I did it the easier it got and it started coming back to me oh I love that and that, I think your journey is definitely going to be one that does inspire others I do know some performers that have had anxiety about going back to performing again after stroke so I love that um advice that you've got for them there yeah I, I've definitely used my humor to get through this whole process like Mm -hmm. even in the hospital I would be like with the nurses I like if I had a new nurse I'd be like I take my pills individually and crushed and I would not take them that way I was just messing with them or like I would be like oh what time do you get off work oh I make sure you have to wipe my butt before you leave like I just I was like I've got to make humor out of this horrible situation to be able to get through it and that's good that you know you found that way to be able to you know, shift yourself through it because it is quite an isolating experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so For tell sure. us about how you got back to work and driving. Well, I, it was, um, yeah. So my stroke was in May of 2022 and by the end of August, I was back to work. I had been with the company I worked for, for eight years, you know, employee of the year, all these accolades. And then um but I when my brother came to visit he helped me drive so I did I just I like with OT they had me tested and they thought that I would be okay to drive and so I wrote the first time I drove I drove with my brother in the car and then I was I was fine I've been driving ever since but I went back to work and then a few months later I got laid off so it's like after all this you know it was like really but I was like this is happening for a reason And now I, after 20 years of property management and that stressful industry, I found a job that's, you know, I'm working as an operations manager, a law firm. It's actually less stress. Um, I'm mostly remote. So it's just, it's a much better environment. I'm much happier. So it all worked out the way it was supposed to. That's great. Um, Was the getting laid off from your previous job, did that have anything to do was it stroke related or just something that happened I would hope like to think not I mean a part of me thinks that it's partially that but I mean other but other people were laid off around the same time Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. like 
there was nothing that I could like prove that that's why they laid me off. Yeah. Well, it's worked out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give to, well, we'll do two questions, one to other stroke survivors and one to like you've, your sister recognized those signs and your brothers come to visit. And so it's like, you've got a really good support system around you. So what advice would you give to other stroke survivors? And what advice would you give to families and support people who are helping people go through life after stroke? I think it's the, the biggest thing for me in the beginning is little things are big things. So being able to make myself a sandwich for the first time, like you've got to celebrate the little wins because the little wins lead up to bigger wins. You know, it's like, as hard as like PT is sometimes just listen to them and follow them and do it because it's only going to make you better and find someone to talk to. You know, I was very lucky. I came home and I had friends staying with me for the first month or so people checking on me, family and friends just really showed up for me, you know? And it's like, that's the people that you've got to lean on. And for, and the advice I would give for um, family and friends is just listen, don't try to fix it. You know, like I would hate when they'd be like, oh, you don't have to cry. You're doing great. It's like, I don't want to hear I'm doing great. I just want you to listen. Like if I'm in the mood to vent and, and I'm frustrated with whatever I'm dealing with, just listen. I think if you just listen and you're there for them, that's like the most important thing. Yeah, I totally agree. I love that. Just being being able to listen because sometimes we don't want someone to fix it. We just want to vent and get it out oh, yeah. and be seen, yeah. heard and validated for our experiences. Exactly, exactly. So is there anything else before we wrap up? Is there anything else that you would like to add or share? Well, I was, can I plug my improv troupe? Bobby? Go for it. Yes. <laughs> so if anybody wants to check us out, we're the jam improv on Instagram and we've got a YouTube channel. We're actually, um, if you go to our Instagram, the um, it's at the jam improv and we have a link to our YouTube page. And on September 4th, we have 20 episodes that are going to be dropping for season one for um, a program we have called should have been an email. So I'm really excited about that. It's, that has been a lifesaver for me this past year and I've loved it. And I, it's, you know, that's another thing, little things you got to just grab onto the fun things in life. And that's one thing I've learned this last year. You can't control everything and life is actually pretty great. You know, the little things that we take for granted, like walking and sitting yeah. up on our own, mm -hmm. like now I appreciate it. I just can sit outside and look at my pool and I'm like, this is amazing. I have a pool that I can go and sit by and I can get out there by myself and do it, you know? Yes. So I love that. I love Life is great. And yeah, you know, appreciate those little things. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we were definitely, I'm definitely going to follow your at the jam improv on yes. Instagram and I'm looking forward to watching season one. It sounds really fun and I can't wait to watch it. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today, Jamie, and thank you for sharing your story with us to help inspire others, which I have no doubt you are absolutely doing. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. It was very nice to, to speak with you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs>